The Feudal Future Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And today we are delighted to have Jacob Siegel with us. Jacob is senior editor at Tablet and a well-published writer who is published in the New York Times, New York Daily News, Politico, Vice, uh, Real uh, Clear Politics. Jacob, welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, today we're going to be talking about an article that you wrote recently in Tablet uh, about disinformation. And uh, you it was an expose of sorts that triggered both uh, Joel and my interest uh, in really wanting to dig more deeply about it. Joel, do you want to kick us off? Yeah. I mean, one of the probably the first question I want to know is why is it that you know the this whole discussion of the censorship industrial complex is being widely dismissed or ignored by the very parts of the media that historically would have been all over this story? Um, is this something that's recent? Is is there any reason to know why this has happened? Uh, the answer is very straightforward. It's that those institutions you're talking about, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, those kinds of uh, pillars of mainstream journalism are themselves parts of the censorship industrial complex. So they largely avoid reporting on this because, for one thing, it would implicate them. But on a, an even uh, less intentional level, you might say, they many of them fail to recognize the uh, the larger system of which they are a part precisely because they operate from within it. So as they would see it, um, I think as the the reporters, and of course I should I should add, though I hope it goes without saying that there are still many, you know, very good, very reputable individual journalists at all of these um, institutions or nearly all of these institutions. But as institutions, they've come to be co-opted into a form of public private information regulation that works uh, through a number of mechanisms. One of those mechanisms uh, is- let, let, through... let, me, let me stop you for just a sure. second. Before we get into the detail on that, I think it's useful for the audience to just backtrack a touch and have you summarize the article that you wrote, Good just point. because I think it's just did a, an astounding piece of journalism um, with a great deal of um, uh, investigation work on your part. So it'd be worth it to tell people kind of what you wrote. Sure. So it's a long piece. It's a 13,000 word expose is the right word for it, a tablet magazine called The Guide to Understanding the Hoax of the Century. And the hoax of the century that I'm referring to is this idea that there was an imminent existential threat from disinformation. So anybody who has turned on cable news over the last six or seven years, opened up a, a mainstream newspaper over the last six or seven years, has seen not only this, this phrase disinformation, which was quite new when it entered the discourse uh, as part of the, the Russiagate phenomenon during the Trump administration, but was presented as a a dire and imminent threat to American oh. national security. So uh, bless you. So over and over again, uh, what we saw was national security officials, cases like the Hunter Biden laptop and the 51 former top national security officials and intelligence officials signed the open letter warning that the laptop might be disinformation. Statements from Hillary Clinton, former President Barack Obama, uh, over and over again, warning about the threat from sometimes foreign disinformation, sometimes domestic misinformation. So there, there was this thing, this, this urgent existential threat, disinformation, misinformation. There was some uh, sort of so, something deliberately vague in its construction. But the clear, clear thing to take away was that it lived on the Internet. It lived on social media and that American democracy could not survive it unless there was some kind of drastic action taken. That was the uh, the mainstream official narrative. That was a uh, deliberately uh, concocted lie. It was a, it was a deception 
that was engineered and perpetrated against the American public for um, political reasons. There was no dire threat from disinformation. There is a, a phenomenon of targeted disinformation from foreign states, as there always has been. America was never under threat from it uh, in an existential sense. It never had a profound or determinative effect on the 2016 election, and claiming that it did was a way for the uh, Obama and Clinton worlds to effectively delegitimize um, Donald Trump and to delegitimize democratic electoral processes writ large, and I think even more fundamentally, perhaps, to declare a, a form of martial law online such that having completely taken over the internet, ostensibly to protect the public against disinformation, they could ensure that uh, there was never again a an opportunity for a kind of populist uprising against them. So I detail how that emerged, where these ideas uh, germinated in, in NATO, in the NATO defense establishment, the various ways in which they germinated, and how this was pulled off, and I provide um, you know a great deal of substantiating evidence to prove what I understand are, are rather dramatic claims. Well, and you know, it, just for people who are viewing this, um, Jacob not only did the the investigative you know work on this, but actually the filter that he is viewing this from is as a former military intelligence officer. So the idea of Organized disinformation campaigns as a strategy is not something that Jacob is new to Jacob, right? So this, so help us understand the historical context of what you found and how it fits with what is in the typical um, military intelligence or disinformation playbook for for countries. It's it's actually a bit a bit complicated in the sense that in the strict sense, disinformation is really a Cold War tactic. It comes from the Russian word desinformatia and large-scale coordinated disinformation campaigns, which are essentially sort of foreign-directed propaganda campaigns for a tactic of the Cold War. You know, sometimes they were used to undermine elections. Sometimes they were used to spread essentially uh, damaging or destabilizing narratives. For instance, you know, the Soviet Union used disinformation campaigns to delegitimize Israel, to delegitimize the United States, to spread the idea that, you know, AIDS was a U.S. government plot. This was, there was a deliberate uh, Soviet effort towards uh, concocting and disseminating these lies that they understood to be politically or ideologically weaponized against their enemies. That's the the sort of technical Cold War meaning of disinformation. It effectively disappears from discourse when the Cold War ends. You see it crop up occasionally, but it, it really is revived through um, the resurgence of Russia in 2014 and Crimea the invasion of Crimea, and then vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia's role in, in attempting to suppress the U.S.-backed Euromaidan movement in Ukraine. And that's where I really became familiar with it. And, and in fact, though I had a background as a military intelligence officer, I was working as a journalist at the time when I saw this. And, and I did recognize that there were on both sides manipulated information operations. And I was very familiar with information operations, which had become a core part of um, US military doctrine. And I, I should add one other thing quickly. The reason why information operations uh, became so core to the US military is because the internet became a key battleground in contests for political and social control. And uh, it was understood early on by key US national security leaders that uh, the way to dominate the internet, which was seen as the key terrain of the 21st century, was effectively through two things, through information control, which you can think of as surveillance tactics like that, and then through information operations. So, so even though the DNA of disinformation started with Soviets, it's now a broadly practiced um, 
broadly practiced by both sides, right? With with information operations and and things like that. It's, so when you think about the the Russia Gate uh, evidence that you brought out that this is a hoax, is this where, where do you lay the the blame for this? Who who was behind this? So the, the people who were behind it is, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, the Clinton campaign was behind it. Former CIA chief John Brennan, who in 2017 effectively authored the first uh, what was known as the ICA, the Intelligence Community Assessment, which initially established the utterly spurious claim since thoroughly disproved claim that uh, that Vladimir Putin had interfered in the U.S. election in 2016 and that he, had, that he had done so deliberately to get Donald Trump elected because Trump was his preferred candidate. And this is what really laid the groundwork for the, the Trump-Russia collusion claims. And so, you know, some of this has come out in subsequent reports, the Durham investigation gets into some of this, but Brennan, who is Obama's CIA chief, and certainly working, you know, to some extent in concert with Obama, certainly in concert with what he understood to be Obama's interests, uh, credentials this claim that Trump is a Putin agent, an absolutely false and unbelievably damaging claim. And Trump is such a wild card and he seems so chaotic and, and he seems so unpredictable. It's, you know, I think that there were millions, tens of millions of reasonable people who are not spies, who are not crazy anti-Trump partisans, but they're just normal Americans. And Trump was so crazy. And your top officials were telling you that he was a Putin agent. So people believed it. So that's largely where it came from. It also came from people like the, you know, FBI director, Andrew McCabe, the high level FBI agents who were colluding, you know, as we know from their their private texts to one another, uh, people like Peter Strzok, who are, who are colluding against Donald Trump in the course of carrying out the supposed investigation of Donald Trump. They're actually texting to say that they're going to prevent him from getting elected. They're going to save America from this dangerous menace. So there are a lot of different people who get get roped into this from various agencies. But at the highest level, it comes directly from the Clinton campaign. It comes directly from people like uh, Podesta, Michael Chertoff, who are, uh, will take a, a leading role later in groups like the Alliance for Securing Democracy, which establishes this Hamilton 68 hoax uh, and from Obama, from John Brennan. It comes from the very top in short. And spreads from there. You know, the fish rots from the head. Yeah. Joel, you're uh, you're on mute. I'm, uh, what about, you know, as a former, you know, member of the U.S. Army, how much has this penetrated the, the, the armed services? We've always prided ourselves in this country that the armed services were above or outside of politics. Has something changed in the, in the Army? You know, I, I get out in 2017, so I don't want to pretend to have any. Um, but you have friends knowledge. then. I do have friends, and my sense from them is that something has changed, but I I don't have a strong sense of how extensive it is. I I think that it is um, certainly more pervasive. I think there is a degree of sort of uh, ideological. Uh, uh, ideological, there, there are pure ideological purity tests to make it to the highest ranks in the military that have been in effect essentially for the last decade. And various public policies have served as proxies for those ideological purity tests. For, for instance, the willingness and the sort of vigor with which people enforced vaccine mandates and refused to grant exemptions for vaccine mandates inside the military. So it can be a little bit hard to judge because that doesn't directly relate to disinformation per se or this sort of one party control in an immediate sense. It seems like a it's a standard aspect of military readiness, you know, medical readiness, getting your necessary vaccines. I had to get vaccines when I went to Iraq and to Afghanistan. So in that sense, it seems normal enough. On the other hand, these can serve as very convenient proxies for testing ideological purity. I think something probably has changed. Um, I don't know that it's 
irreparable. I don't know quite how bad the rot is, but the more fundamental problem is that having having created a military command structure that abandoned the idea that its primary responsibility was to secure victory in foreign wars, everything else became possible. So people are worried about woke generals and, you know, reasonably Millie talking about uh, whatever it was, teaching Kendi at West Point. Yeah, it's pretty disturbing. We shouldn't be teaching Kendi to West Point graduates, not because he's left wing per se, but because this is, you know, a historical nonsense and uh and and it's uh shows a total lack of rigor and academic seriousness on the other hand it was the lack of military seriousness that came first so it's not that we had a woke military and that produced a bunch of generals who could no longer win wars we had a military that had abandoned military leadership i should say at the higher levels that had ab- abandoned uh, its most core and essential responsibilities and was selected by the political leadership in part for its willingness to abandon those core responsibilities and to pursue political ends instead. And then we got this this kind of wokeness on top of that. Well, so so let's, I mean, by the way, military is not the only institution in the world, in the United States that has built in, uh, you know, well, uh, uh, ideological tests and uh, wokeness about it. So it's just a reflection, I think, of the rest of the rest of society. But the question I've got that your article brings up is really where all of this is going. You know, we're moving into a world with where the technology for disinformation, the technology to convince people that stories are real, with deep fake videos, audios, uh, generative uh, 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 AI, the op- it seems to me that the opportunity to abuse this is just incredibly richer and than I, what it was uh, six months ago. Even and I, and I just want to say, and also, what is the role in this? What Marshall's talking about of of the big tech platforms you know, who have more control over information than probably anyone in the history of the yeah. country. Well, I think the way that uh, I'm glad you added that addendum, Joel, because I think that we can look at that as a, a dichotomy or uh, those two uh, those two phenomena are in tension to some extent. On the one hand, you have big tech and big tech platforms as monopolistic data platforms that exercise an astonishing, never before seen in human history degree of control over the information about billions of human beings and which have become over the last seven years effectively um, part of a single integrated information control regime with the government, right? That's one aspect of disinformation is that what the U.S., government-led effort to counter disinformation did um, was to effectively co-opt these, the most powerful corporations in human history and say, we can no longer allow Facebook and Twitter to operate independently. It's now a national security risk to do so because our elections will be hacked. Therefore, we will install government regulators, secretly install government regulators inside of these companies so that we can purge and control and and surveil dangerous information. You have that on the one hand. On the other hand, you have the risk that Marshall is describing where generative AI, uh, you know, machine learning, you know, can produce these very convincing deep fakes, can uh, produce, you know, potentially written documents in the voice or the style of a particular public official, you, you could then hack somebody's Twitter account and now you've got a, a convincing imitation of their voice and you you tweet from their account, it doesn't get noticed. It, you know, you can imagine many possibilities here. I view the first thing we discussed, the effectively totalitarian risk, as a a far greater risk, you could look at it as a totalitarian risk versus the anarchic risk. On the one hand, you have the risk of 1984 Big Brother style, top-down information control. 
On the other end of the spectrum, you have the risk of a sort of wilderness of illusion and deception. I view the former as the, the much greater risk, in part because um, one of the things that these AI technologies will generate is counter deception technologies. So the deep fakes that you're talking about won't be undetectable. And in fact, there will be AIs specifically designed to detect them. Even more fundamentally, these are not the first large scale illusions in human history. They're, they're, they're not the first things that have uh, 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 been presented to the public that have been fake in some sense. And you, I, I believe that we have you know, millennia-old uh, millennia evolved responses to these kinds of deceptions that given the opportunity to exercise will work themselves out in the long run. That doesn't mean that nobody will be deceived in the short run. It doesn't mean that there won't be some even potentially disasters along the way that could be very costly in the short run. But in the long run, we will develop our own resistance to these deceptions. And the greater risk to me is that we give up on the human ability, human reason, human understanding. We give up on that and we trust in some expert technocratic class to save us from this grave risk. And in so doing, we give away our political freedom and our freedom of conscience and our freedom of expression and to me, that's the greater risk. Well, and you know, it's interesting you should say that because I, I was reading an article the other day about the um, the prevalence of uh, algorithmic trading in financial markets and how the net long-term effect has actually been that the AIs fight each other, they, they unearth pat trading patterns in nanoseconds as they emerge and they cancel each other out. And that the net result of that has been a reduction in fluctuation. And that we lull ourselves into thinking that that placidity is a benefit, right? Mm -hmm. That somehow, you know, we just kind of, uh, we, we kind of balm the highs and lows. And I wonder whether or not that is something that will extend into the broader society, whether or not at the end of the day, this competing information war between for people where we're trying to get you know, advocates for a particular position to affiliate and then counter advocates on the other side, whether they at the end of the day just cancel themselves out and we end up with um, a placid, um, listless population. Um, you know, I, I think that as long as there is a, a free and open domain of human inquiry and debate that a placid and listless population is unlikely in a country like America. Um, what would produce listlessness uh, would be the, um, I think the, the divestment of political sovereignty. Uh, so if we trade away our political sovereignty under threat, if we say, take the, use an analogy with the Patriot Act, if we say, the, the risks are so great, we can no longer entrust ourselves with this kind of freedom. Therefore, let's countenance these violations of the Constitution to protect ourselves from these potential risks. If we do that, that's what induces listlessness, in my opinion. Being fought over by competing factions, that sounds to me like politics. Um, and um, it might be you know, might not always be pleasant, but I would rather a, a degree of unpleasantness and retain my my fundamental freedom, which is the basis um, for my dignity, than to trade that away for uh, false security. I just want one, and one thing that that I have, you know, I'm not a huge Elon Musk fan on a lot of levels, but when you think about it, if Elon Musk didn't exist, most of this stuff would never have come out. Um, and, and, you know, so, I mean, I guess we're fortunate that one of the oligarchs has at least some vague feelings about free speech. Frankly, I think most of them have no concept of the constitution of the history of the United States. You know, they're the, the people running the tech companies and 
I'm going to be careful, but I'll say it anyway, uh, are they're engineers, they're, they're you know, zero one people, and, and history and politics and society is not zero one, but they try to turn it into zero one. And then the fact is a lot of them are not American citizens and or natives to the United States. We're not educated here. Um, I mean, sometimes I listen to, you know, the heads of these big companies and I'm saying, you know, like, didn't you go to school? Did, you know, didn't you, didn't you take, you know, high school civics at some point? Um, I mean, that's what, I, you know, I find frightening is, you know, it's like um, Aldous Huxley wrote that a technological dictatorship can never be overthrown. And I wonder if we allow those people to keep going and the, and, and it happens to be a guy from Africa, you know, uh, Elon Musk, who's the only one who said, wait, this, this is BS. I'm going to expose it. Um, yeah. if, we, if we hadn't had Elon Musk, what would have happened? Yeah. So uh, on the one hand, I think that we should, we're, we're indebted to Elon Musk. I think that there is no honest accounting of the facts that it wouldn't reflect that um, American civic society at the moment is healthier and better off for his intervention. There are just fundamental facts about the political life of the United States over the past decade that came out in the last less than a year through the Twitter files that we simply wouldn't know about had it not been for Elon Musk. You cannot have democratic self-government without self-understanding and without knowledge of the world. We would not have that knowledge had Elon Musk not single-handedly, somewhat capriciously, decided to dump all these Twitter files on the public. On the other hand, we find ourselves now in a position where we're beholden to the whims of a totally mercurial, um, China-aligned billionaire. And I don't think that that's especially healthy for democratic self-government either. Now forced to choose, obviously I prefer the Twitter file style dumps. And I have no doubt that Musk has some principled belief in free speech, but I'm not sure I understand what exactly that principled belief is, quite how far it extends. His treatment of Matt Taibbi suggests that he's more than willing to curtail those principles when they run into not even problems of, of interest necessarily, but when there's just a personality disagreement, he seems willing to curtail it. So it's not a good position for the country to be in in the long run to have our constitutional rights um, granted to us at the whim of billionaires. You know, that's a, it's like now, now, okay, yeah, okay. So we have some of our freedom back, but it's, you know, it's it's an oligarchic dispensation, not uh, not given to us by God and protected by by the, the state and the Constitution. Not great. You know, you know, by the same token, something to kind of keep in mind is that while we're sitting here and debating the societal and political impacts of all of this stuff on the economic level, there is a relentless trend toward optimization. That is what has driven all of these technologies to develop to begin with, right? Which is <clears throat> to be able to take chaos, milk the chaos out of it so that you can get a, a better return for the amount of work that you put in. That is the relentless time march of business and of economics. So we're seeing a little bit of a conflict here between um, what happens when you bring out what, what the impetus is for bringing out a new technology, what the natural tendency is once the technology is brought out, and then the limits of what that technology means to the life and, and uh, freedom of human beings. If you look at it from a business point of view or from an economics point of view, most economists are, are advocating going for the return rather than the freedom. And yeah, so I, I, that, that's something we have right, to deal with, right? right? We have to we have to reconcile those two philosophies. Look, I, I mean, I, not to uh, butter up the hosts here, but the, you know, this is why I find your work, Marshall and Joel's work, um, so valuable in this regard. Is that 
the direction of that optimization seems to me basically futile because it leads to ever greater degrees of concentration. So the optimization occurs, but a, you know, the first question is what's being optimized. So the product that is being optimized in information technologies now is, if not largely, then in large measure, human beings, right? Like the behavioral patterns of human beings. So we're not, these are not products being optimized for us. We are the products being optimized. And then secondarily, what does that optimization lead to? Does it lead to um, higher living standards? Does it lead to you know greater job security? Does it lead to a more healthy society? It seems that uh, digital societies produce a peculiar hybrid of hyper-optimization with tremendous returns on the one hand and uh, hyper-concentration on the other hand. So those returns are going to fewer and fewer people and, and we head down the feudal path and I would right. rather not. Right, and, and this is the noblesse oblige question that we keep coming up against when we deal with the Feudal Future podcast, which is, do we want to rely on the generosity and quote, civic spiritedness, which is, hasn't really evidenced itself yet, uh, among the among the oligarchs for the bulk of our living. And that's going to be the big problem that we're going to we're going to face. You know, the good news is it does look like that some of these oligarchs actually have a soul and do have some moral core. They're trying, they give money away, right? The Bill Gateses of the world and even the Bezos of, of the world give give money away to be able to help people who have not been able to participate in that in that upswing. But do we really want to build a society where we have to rely on them? I don't know. This is the this is oh. the Joel Potkin question. Mm. Oh, wait a minute. I have to jump in here because it, I, I have to say, I mean, I was prepared to agree with you before you said Bezos and Gates giving this money away. Is, I mean, I don't think that I'm not questioning whether Gates and uh, Bezos have souls. I will grant that they have souls um, in a strict sense. But, you know, as you well know, billionaire oligarchic philanthropy is one of the primary means of political control for them. It is that is how they dominate societies is through philanthropy. So uh, dominate political systems, dominate the civic life of a society. So, um, yeah, I don't. I'll grant that they have souls, but, I, (laughs) you know, know they're like. Yeah, we let them do their, single, whatever tzedakah not, they do in, in private, I'll right. say that goes to their soul. The public works, uh, you know, either they redound to the benefit of the society in obvious and manifest ways or, or not. Well, well, and I, I would like to say that not one single billionaire oligarch has funded any of our research yet. <laughs> and so I, I invite them if they would like to be able to do that. We will be happy to. to talk. <laughs> Joel, go ahead. You were about to. Yeah, I I guess what, what we know because uh, obviously we've been going through a lot of stuff. But what I'd like to sort of focus on at the end is what steps can we take? What what policy steps can be take can we take um, so that this kind of collusion doesn't get worse and worse because. You know, I, I'm an old journalist, both old and a journalist. And, um, you know, I read newspaper articles and I, 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 my poor wife has to hear me scream, where the hell was the editor? Isn't there another side to this? I know that AP, uh, NPR and, and Consumer Reports are taking money directly from green nonprofits, hiring reporters whose job it is to produce a certain kind of story. Um, how do we how do we combat that? How do we? Push back against it. And and I, I have no answers. Maybe you do. Well, uh, the first thing to note there is just that what you just described with the uh, green economy to journalism pipeline exists virtually in, in identically in the counter disinformation journalism space. So nominally, you know, civic nonprofit groups, which are actually controlled by uh, you know, major donors to the Democratic Party, largely, and which are effectively political operations, endow these 
fact checking and counter disinformation initiatives at various newspapers. They've put tens of millions of dollars into this just over the last year, right? They pay the salaries of these journalists ostensibly so that they can do, you know, it's supposed to be this objective, you know, third party fact checking and, and countering disinformation work, but which is in effect brazenly partisan, explicitly political, consists in, you know, uh, refuting or, or attempting to rebuke claims like, for instance, that COVID-19 might have originated from a laboratory in Wuhan, um, you know, or that Hunter Biden's laptops belonged to the president's son, Hunter Biden, and contained information which might be germane to uh, an election in the United States. In other words, these same sorts of initiatives have been funded ostensibly to act, you know, as civically responsible watchdogs, but are purely partisan and have repeatedly censored true information. So that's the first thing to say. What can we do about it? I'm not as good on. Um, this is, uh, you know, I'm not a policy guy. I'm a, an observer and a writer. Um, but to me, it, it seems that one step to take would be towards some kind of data rights. And I think these, for one thing, I think that these companies are too big to, to be acting the way they are. Um, data rights would both make it more difficult to build these ultra uh, dossiers, surveillance dossiers, which is what these companies build is, you know, surveillance dossiers. They can then um, optimize and sell. And if you had some sort of annuity on data that was extracted from you or that came from you, it would make it more difficult. It would introduce frictions into that that I think would at least reduce the scale potentially. So I think some kind of data rights is important. Uh, you know, data ownership, I should say. Not data rights in the more European sense, which might be a step in the right direction, but doesn't go far enough. The American thing to do would be not to say we'll come up with an arbitrary set of rights that the you know government bureaucrats will then enforce. It'll say, you own this, you know? You know, not not you have a right at the at the privilege of the the technocratic authority, but no, this is yours. It came from you. You own it. People who want to take it away from you need to pay you something for it. So I think that, that would be a step in the of, right direction. Uh, that's the essence of surveillance capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, which I'm I presume you've read. And that yes. is that you know, okay, hey, we're we're making money. They're making money on us. Let's let's uh, at least get a piece of it. Um. The other question I have is whether or not your original idea of about half an hour ago, which was that um, let's let the let's let the AIs fight it out. Maybe one of the battlegrounds for that is this detection of bias notion, right? The idea of underlying all of this, right, is the notion of um, of uh, CF, right? CF is the uh, is collaborative filtering. And collaborative filtering is the original technology that went into recommendation engines that really kind of is at the core of um, why a story might appeal to you and not appeal to somebody else and trying to build groups of people that affiliate with different, with different stories. And my sense is that there's probably some gold in there to be able to use that technology to be able to call out and say, hey, this is a story that's being promulgated by this group and make it transparent, make it obvious that the computer is aiming toward this particular target audience and bringing out that underlying underlying motive power that they're, that the, the creators of the algorithms are, are uh, employing. I know, what do you think of that? No, I, I think uh, you said it very well. I think you just hit the nail on the head, but that is... Um, that is a, a sort of best case scenario, or, or it's one, good, who knows where this is going to lead, but that's a very good use case for ways in which AIs can be designed that can also be tweaked um, potentially at sort of local level. So you can imagine an AI that is doing the sort of bias filtering you're describing 
with specifications that are set by an individual owner, even down to the individual level. You know, you might you might want to be looking for particular forms of bias. And, you know, of course, people will point out that you can program in your own bias, but this is where it gets recursive. You know, it's in, in the sense that, yes, you can program in bias, you can detect bias, and, and those two things, it might be chasing after its own tail. But in the end, it's you, the human reasoning being, who has to make the ultimate judgments about these things. So the fact that they're, you know, in some sense, incomplete, um, just reflects the fact they don't actually think. They do what we tell them to. And they might do it in ways that appear like magic to us and that we can't understand, but they still don't think. And so I think that that's, that's exactly where the better uses of this are heading. Um, I have talked to some people in AI who are working on precisely these kinds of things now, um, using LLMs, the large language models that go into chat GPT and chat and, and you know generative AIs, using them to remove forms of bias from articles. And you know you could imagine also doing that in a way where you take an article, which if you only scanned it, would seem to be sort of purely ideological. But if you could remove the, like the top five graphs that frame the narrative, maybe there's a lot of useful information there. So you know you can imagine actually a way in which you could clean up or or de de ideologize some of the news to actually make it potentially more useful. Well, what a concept. The idea of actually human beings using their brain to to think this is this could be this could be an innovation that we we come to to enjoy in the future. Jake, thank you so much. This has been a really, really interesting session. Thank you so much for all the work you do to get to the bottom of what's going on out there. And we appreciate your being on the Feudal Future podcast and look forward to having you come back again. Thanks so much for having me. Big fan, big fan. The Feudal Future.